Hey, magandang araw mga ka-edoc trends. I'm here to share with you my insights in teaching coding online. So, let me introduce myself. I am Leia. I'm an experienced IT instructor for 20 years now. I'm also an e-learning specialist, a learning management system administrator of uh, De La Salle College of St. Peniel, and I'm also a web designer and developer passionate in creating meaningful and compelling web and e-learning experiences and projects. So, I am here to discuss to you the following. First, what are the challenges of school in teaching coding during pandemic? Second is how I teach coding online. And of course, the third topic is about some tips and tricks on how to successfully implement coding online classes. Okay, so let's begin. Kumusta na po ba kayo? So, how are you coping with this COVID pandemic? Uh, sobrang obvious po ang impact nito sa education. So, let me just share with you some data from UNESCO. So, according to this data, as of July 3, 2020, there are about 1 billion, 67 million affected learners all over the world. Sobrang obvious ng issue na ginawa nitong COVID sa atin. And some schools are challenged to offer coding or computer programming class during this pandemic. Is it still necessary or i-focus na lang nila ang kanilang resources sa major subjects? Marami sa kanila ang nagtatanong, is it still relevant to teach coding? So bilang computer teacher or bilang computer instructor for 20 years now, naniniwala ako na ang coding should be considered as a basic literacy, especially in this digital age. It is very important for our students to understand how technology around is working. Technology such as email, internet, website, and etc. And having students learn coding, prepare them for the future. Okay, kaya lang, yun nga. With the schools closing due to this COVID pandemic issue, schools around are asking how to provide coding lessons in some schools na dependent sa old way of delivering instructions, like using a classroom type or using instruction base na nangyayari sa isang computer laboratory. Imayin natin, ano ba yung mga challenges in teaching coding? So the first one is, technicality of the subject. So, it's really uh, time-consuming and it's difficult to grasp due to the technicality of the subject matter. So, kaya minsan mahirap maghanap ng, ng isang uh, computer teacher because of the technicality of the subject. And it's a challenge, especially sa isang online setup. Second, isolation. There is no doubt that online education has enabled students to work independently. Pero hindi siya nag-work sa lahat. Some students are dependent on face-to-face -face instructions or dependent sila sa socialization. So, this is another challenge. Now, the next thing is the expert's blind spot. A lot of uh, computer educators, for them to deliver effectively the lesson, they have to put themselves into the shoes of the beginners. Hindi sila pwedeng maging technical right away. The key idea of teaching programming language is to, to think and understand the concepts like a novice. Or else, hindi mag engage ang mga estudyante natin or isipin nila nosebleed yan or isipin nila sobrang technical. This is actually a challenge especially for those na galing sa computer science na magtuturo sa isang secondary or sa isang basic uh, education level. Another challenge in teaching coding is the instant feedback. Okay, it's very critical to provide swift and responsive feedback sa mga estudyante, especially if you're teaching coding. Just imagine if you're just going to meet your students one uh, once a week, tapos online pa, tapos hindi nila na-figure out kung saan sila nagkamali. Uh, sa classroom kasi, what you can do is you can just move around and then check the the computers of your students and check kung anong isang area sila nagkamali. Pero paano na kung online siya? Diba? So, those are some of the challenges. Okay, let me address those challenges. So, how I teach coding. So, let me just share with you how I address the challenges. The four challenges that I, I mentioned. Okay, the first one, okay, using a structured course plan. It is very important that you organize your content in a manner that 
your students will going to consume it or digest it. Kung nag-work yun, even kahit sa online setup. When I plan my course, I consider the timetables, the routines, the deliverables, and even the programming activities. So let me just share with you my uh, my course. Ayan. So Minter 5 is uh, an advanced course in web design. So when I present my content or my course structure, I everything is complete day one palang. So from the overview, I included here a course syllabus in the overview para alam na nila kung what to expect from weeks 1 to 14. And when I organize the content that I'm using some codes like numbers, ayan, numbers for week 1 to week 14. And I see to it also that, that I'm using submodules for my activities and resources. So, magkakasama lahat ng mga activities ko at magkakasama rin lahat ng resources ko. So, the activities are the activities that I ask my students to, to submit something, whether it's an online text or, or it's a link or a file. I see to it na, na very clear ang deadlines at instructions. For example, every week I have this uh, class participation that will serve as their attendance. So I have a call to action. So, ang tawag ko sa kanya ay call to action. Then, of course, my activities are all project-based or problem-based activities. So, particular kami sa assessment. That's why we're using problem-based activities. Okay, second, so I use varied instructional activities and assessment. So, nabagit ko na kanina that we are very particular in um, providing authentic assessments to our students. So, we provide active learning opportunities. So, we provide hands-on learning activities, design challenges and case studies, and even collaborative and pair drill activities. So, ayan po yung mga example ng activities ko. Okay, to answer the uh, challenge number one, the technicalities, I communicate in multiple formats. Hindi po limited lang sa LMS ang pag-communicate ko ng instructions or pagsagot ko ng questions. Of course, I'm using the standard feature of the LMS such as LMS email and even I enable the notifications para alam ko, alam ng mga sudyante ko na whenever I update something, ma or, or mabibigyan sila ng alert. And I always utilize also the news feed. And aside from those uh, built-in uh, communication tools sa learning management system namin, I'm using all means to communicate, such as Facebook or FaceTime. Ayan. So, Facebook, using the Facebook Messenger. Or sometimes, nagpa FaceTime din ako or iMessage. What is good about uh, online learning is that sa, sa ano ko po, sa experience ko, mas naging open yung mga estudyante ko sa akin in terms of like, uh, or sharing what they're really experiencing. Ayan. So, kung mapapansin nyo po dun sa examples ko, I have a student of, I have a student of mine who's having, who had a difficulty with access, a student of mine having a difficulty uh, coping with mental health, and the other one is having a difficulty uh, with the type of activity that I use in class. Okay. So, lahat naman po yan ay na-address ko. Okay. It's just a matter of being sincere and being sensitive then on the way you are communicating with them, especially during this time. Next, number four. Okay, provide timely and useful feedback. So it's necessary, especially if like if your course is a series of iterations just like ours. Kasi yung final project po namin is we, we are doing a, a client-based website that we iterate. Okay, so yung version two is based from the feedback of iteration of version one. So Feedback is necessary to keep your students on track. So, it also impacts the student's interest in learning the next topic. So, and then when you do your feedback, it's not just simply saying, very good, excellent. Okay, so it's not like that. Mas malalim pa kung feedback ang kailangan natin. Okay. And last but not the least, I think ito yung pinaka-effective na, te na technique na ginawa ko in teaching coding. So, what I did, I provided step-by-step uh, -step instruction and tutorials using YouTube. So, gumawa po ako ng playlist from day 1 to day 14 or weeks 1 to 14 para gamitin reference ng mga estudyante ko in setting up their website. So, um, uh, maraming mga estudyante ko na yung iba, hindi na nag-attend ng synchronous session namin at tinignan na lang yung uh, 
bite-sized lessons ko on the following. So, I see to it na clear and concise lang yung instruction. So, uh, nag-work naman siya and a lot of my students, I mean, were able to accomplish or were able to finish their iterations 1 to 3 using this video tutorials. Let me just share with you some tips and tricks on how you can uh, deliver a very successful online class. First, okay, you have to set a dedicated consultation hours. Have a schedule wherein the students can drop into a video call and ask you questions, whether it's through Zoom, Google Meet, or FaceTime, or even Facebook Messenger. Ayan. So, second, kaya importante para sa akin ng course structure. You have to set clear expectations. Dapat sa course structure mo palang, hindi na sila malito. Okay? Dapat alam mo kung paano nila iku-consume yung information na ipo-provide mo sa kanila. Third, eto nag-work to. You have to set up a dedicated programming bodies or groups. Okay, what I did with my online class last term is I randomly group them. Medyo hindi nag-work yun kasi it's random. Now, ngayon, ang plan ko is of course to group my students according to um, according to friends. Feeling ko mas magiging meaningful sa kanila yung grouping kung mag-work together sila sa mga taong komportable sila. Number four, have students fill out a daily reflection. Uh, though for some, medyo corny na to sa kanila. But I think a simple form sa learning management system nyo or sa Google Classroom nyo, asking how, let's say for example, asking what uh, what they have learned for, for a particular topic, I think that would work. Okay, so you have to review the responses and reach out to students who need help. What is good about having like this this kind of form is that nakukuha mo yung ano nila eh, yung take nila sa topic mo for the day and marami sa kanila ang honest based po sa experience ko to kasi naglalagay talaga ako ng ano parang uh, rating rate nila yung learning experience nila per week and nagiging honest po sila sa mga sagot nila next Add self-assessment opportunities. Okay, this allows the students to take more responsibility for their own learning. And grading their own output is somehow motivating and sometimes a humbling experiences for students. Ang nakakatawa pa dito, honest talaga sila in grading. And sometimes after, let's say for example, first week nagpa-self-assessment ka, seventh week ka sabihin nila sa'yo, means pwede po pang bawiin yung grade ko nung week one. Kasi mas natuto na po ako ngayon. So something like that. Up next, improve course accessibility for all. I think dapat number one yata ito. Um, part din to ng, ano eh, ng setting expectations. I mean, part din to ng, uh, ng course plan. Consider having course materials that don't create barriers. Pwede namang i-iterate to every term. Kung hindi nag-work last term yung course structure mo, maybe you can have a different uh, course design plan next term na uh, sa palagay mo ay mag-work based sa needs ng mga estudyante mo. Next, of course, this is very important. You have to somehow or gamify your course content with badges and certificates. And nag work po ito kahit sa higher education. So, you have to recognize the achievement of students through uh, by sending them badges and certificates kung hindi po available sa LMS nyo. Okay, the purpose of the badges is for, for, for you to be able to encourage your students to uh, continue to be engaged. Uh, and it's a form of reward too. Okay, so that's it. Uh, simply lang po. Okay, but let me end uh, this uh, presentation with a video. Actually, paborito ko tong video na to. Okay, it's about making a shift from student engagement to empowerment. Okay. We often talk about what it means to move from compliance to engagement. It's the idea of creating an environment where students want to learn rather than have to learn. But if we want students to be creative, self-directed learners, we need to move beyond student engagement and into empowerment. But this requires some paradigm shifts. That's right, we are going to be talking shift. Here's what I mean. The empowered classroom is a shift from giving choices to inspiring possibilities. It's a shift from making the subject interesting into tapping into the student interest. When you go from saying you must learn this to asking what do you want to learn? It's a shift from taking assessments to 
assessing your own learning, an iterative process full of mistakes that ultimately lead to success. It's a shift from the teacher asking all the questions to the students asking their own questions, where they chase the inquiry process and take learning off-road. It's a shift from uncritical consuming to critical consuming and creating. Here students move from critical consuming to inspiration to creativity, where they use the design process to launch their work to the world. It's a shift from differentiating instruction to personalizing learning. And it's a shift from rigid to adjustable systems so that students own the process. They can set their own pace, choose their own formats, and decide what resources they want to use to accomplish their goals. It's a shift in mindset from compliance to self-direction. In other words, it's a shift towards student ownership. And when that happens, our students become the creative critical thinkers who change the world. I believe that teaching coding skills and integrating this with problem-based activities is about empowering your students or empowering our students. Empowering our students to think creatively, reason systematically, and of course, work collaboratively. So that would be all. Thank you and good day.